Shavuot Tov, Ephraim, Wenger, how are you? Shavuot Tov, I'm doing very well. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. We had, what, two weeks gap? Between been our last session? Weeks off with, um, yeah. I don't know what was going on, just work and life. So there's a lot of things going on, and we're back at Sefer Etzirah, so very exciting. Yes, um, we have uh, chapters 2, 3, and 2, 4. Actually, um, let me hold the page here. 2, 3 is pretty easy to think about time-wise, but 2-4, we might have to break this up into part one and part two. 2-4 two, is amazing. 2-4 is really sophisticated, uh, very deep. Um, I wouldn't mind spending another session on 2-4. He's bringing in a 2-4, a lot of Abulafia systems with permutation. And it's really something to like, kind of like sit down and spend the time on figuring it out. Yes. But Here's probably you're right. We're we're gonna, yep. I mean, these are the 231 gates of the letters interacting with each other. We're, we're talking mm -hmm. some heavy stuff here and all the charts. Eliezer Rokeach of Worms is here. Wow. This is some two for something else. So um, yeah, let's, so let's, uh, let's hit it. Yeah. Let's hit the two, three. Uh, that's a short one. I'll start with, um, with, uh, with the Hebrew. Mm -hmm. Let's also dedicate this Shiur uh, Leilu Nishmat, Rav Yonatan Zaks. You know, Bogdan Amit, one of the greatest, probably the really great giant leader in the Jewish community that passed away yesterday from cancer. Yeah, Rabbi Lord Jonathan Seth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So may his Aliyah has, has a neshama, and may his, really his spirit and his teaching impact the entire world, because he was really, not only that he was in a major Jewish thinker and had a great impact in the Jewish world, he also had a great impact on the entire world mm -hmm. around him. Absolutely. Um, he had a lot of speeches so, in the Jewish parliament and... Yeah. Met top leaders. In fact, um, I sp I've read a lot of his books. Was really influenced, and then I got to meet him very briefly in New York. Oh and wow! I, and I said, um, I really love your work and your books. You've inspired me, and I I venture out and I meet with different religious leaders, including uh, local Sikh faith community leaders. And he said, Oh, that's wonderful. And he said, I myself met one of the head Sikhs in India and discussed matters of God and spirituality. Wow. So I, like wow, that's a, that's a very good. That's I thought so just amazing. The he was living it out himself, going out and meeting all these religious leaders. Amazing person. Amazing individual. It's unbelievable. Yes. Very powerful person. Yeah. Yeah. Let yeah. me make sure my WhatsApp is turned off and let's get rolling. There we go. All right. So dedicating this to Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, may Shem Shama have Aliyah of all the great Torah he's given us. May we continue his legacy. Amen. Amen. Okay. With that said, Karik Bet. משנה ג' על שלושים ושתיים מרציות יסוד חקיקן בכל חצבן ברוח קבאן בפך וחמישה מקומות. רוח א' ח' ה' עין בגרון ג' ד' ח' ק' בחך ד' ת' ט' ל' נ' ת' בלשון ז' ס' ש' ר' ש' צ' ד' סופית בשיניים ב' ו' מ' פ' סופית בשפתיים. אה, אוקיי. Yeah, so 22 foundation letters, he engraved them with voice. He carved them mm. with breath. He set them in the mouth. And then we're going to talk about the different areas of, of speaking. In five yeah. places, Aleph Chet He Ayin, that's in the throat, the guttural. Gimel Yud Kav Chuf, or Kuf, is in the palate, or palatals. Dalet Tet Lamed Nun Tav, that's in the tongue, linguals. Ashon. Mm -hmm. Yep. Zayin Samach Shin Reish Sadi, that's in the teeth, what they call the dentals. Mm. And then um, bet vav uh, men pei. That's man. in English. Yeah. So wow. Everything about the Hebrew language encompasses or reflects everything the way that a human speaks. Wow. So they really like the twenty-two letters are expressed in kol ruach and bapei, like uh, sound, spirit, and mouth. Mm -hmm. And I think going back to like a, one of the first pieces where we could see that the, like the first letter, the Aleph, mm -hmm. takes the three, the way, the way the Aleph is expressed, it comes from Aleph, which is the, um, the throat, which is all the way the deepest part, is the throat, is the A, ah, right? And then Lamed, it goes into Lamed, which is Lashon, your tongue, and that's the middle part. And then Aleph, the pace of it, Sfatayim, your, your, so it goes from within out. Right, yeah. from the deepest middle and into the out, and then the exact same letters aleph is also pele, 
going backwards. And pet is from outside, from within, right? So it starts with your, with your, um, with your lips, lamed, and back to aleph in the inside, in the gavon, in the throat. Yeah, I think it's um, a lot of um, what is the essence of the Hebrew language to really convey how important every aspect of speech is for ourselves and with other people and then with, with Hashem. It's quite a unique yeah. thing. Yeah. So let's see if uh, Rabbi Kaplan here has something interesting to add. Um, I'm sure he does. I, I like the idea that he has about the ordering of the vowels, how uh, we think about the different sounds, and then if there's dentals or linguals or gutturals, and then we break it down into the ordering of the vowels. Is it A-E-I-O-U or is it E-O-E-A? There's a certain order. I mean, there's, it's a really fascinating systemization of language, which I think, if I could summarize what I think is the theme of this class today is how do you take language and then break it down and rearrange it so you can almost, almost break down your own thinking and rearrange it to look at things differently in a new way so don't keep treading the same paths because probably Hashem and Hashem's intelligence that he's beaming to us or sort of the inner voice of God comes from a different path, not the ones we're used to. We have to shake things up in our mind to see things different. Mm. Very well said, yeah. So it's an interesting thing. I mean, the way it's... Um... Also, the words that it uses, again, like these are uh, so much repetitive concepts and words, mm -hmm. but they are expressed just in, in different ways and, and concepts here. So at first, like it says, 22, 22 foundational letters. So so use again to the, to the word chakak, engraving. So that's going back to the first opening of the piece, right? Mm -hmm. Right? In other words, in 32 paths, God engraved, God engraved 32 paths of wisdom. Yeah. And this action of engraving is an interesting one, like going back to that action that is seen as associated here with code, with sound. Mm -hmm. um, and the action of engraving is like removing, right? Removing like a piece of, if you think about it, engraving something, into, engraving your name into stone, for example, is you're removing pieces of stone while simultaneously you're also writing a name. So it's like a, it's a dual action that happens in an engravement. Um, and then what is chatzav and, and what's inter... Uh, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, so I was saying chakak bekor. So it's like a, it's associated, it's saying that he engraved in speech or in sound. And I'm just trying to figure out like, how, how, what does that look like? Um, I mean, I think it, what, what exactly does that mean? Yeah, I think it goes a little bit just what I was saying about, you know, you have to dig out the old paths to create the new ones, you know, you have mm. to clear out the old to make a new path. And I think all the neurologists or the thing that I hear people say is neural pathways. That's the kind of catchphrase I hear, but it really makes sense to me. There's some pathway in our brain that we retrain and to engrave means to dig out the old and carve out something new. I think that's why engraving is such a powerful verb. I think that's what you're, you're hitting on. Right. It's interesting. So engraving was, was the first action of creating the world. Mm -hmm. So in other words, it ha it's letting go of something old or removing something old to create space for something new, right? Uh, like that's, that's what I think, I think what it is here. Yeah, I, I think about Hashem, you know, just a being by himself, no, no, nothing to reflect on, no, no way to know himself. And, um, you know, creation mm -hmm. is that, not that Hashem has needs, but there was a need for him to have a relationship with something. So he, he car carved out a creation, but it still, none of it had free will. It was just animals that just did things by instinct, but he really engraved mm. in us, you know, the ability to right. like said, let go of total control and he gave us free will, which is an amazing, right. and what an amazing gift gave us free will to either choose to reach out to Hashem or to ignore Hashem and just, I don't know, build stuff down right. here. Like, I think that's part of the engraving. It's amazing, yeah. So it's a, overall, what, what I'm understanding here, it seems that it really is a set that you guys present is kind of like connecting the 22 letters and breaking them down into like, you know, into the five uh, voc vocal points. Is that how you would say it in English? Yeah, vocal um, points or, or um, sounds that the physical voice can make. Right, and just breaking it into, into these five categories mm -hmm. of, <clears throat> of, of, of letters and where they come from or where they are expressed in, in the in the mouth or from within. Right. So we said like there's the 
throat, teeth, tongue, and mouth. Yeah, and you mix those um, with, the, uh, with the vowels, so you get six vowels, five, I guess, sounds. <clears throat> right. I really like this. If you see this in Rabbi Kaplan, he's talking about a real tangible exercise. And he's saying something to the effect of saying the letters, contemplating each letter, pronouncing it with the breath, set them in the mouth. And this exercise, each family may also be pronounced with its appropriate vowel. And this yields a chant that can be used for every exercise. And he's got a table for it. And the purpose of this exercise is to make the initiate highly aware of the physical processes involved in pronouncing the letters. While speech itself involves being a consciousness, the pronunciation of the letters is an automatic activity. I love that word or mm. phrase. And hence it involves hachma consciousness. So I, mm. I think that leads us when we, you know, we talk about avalafia and I think he's re referring to an avalafia practice here and that eventually yeah. it becomes automatic. You just feel the letters coming out, you feel the words coming out and you start just to become an observer of it. Yeah. I think so. I think he is referring to Abu Dhafi. I was just thinking about Abu Dhafi's system, which is um, it's, it's slightly very, very in very in, in very specific and um, in his book Chayyeh Ulam the future of the, of the next world. Also in Or mm -hmm. right, the, the light of the intellect, um, which I haven't learned that that one. I've actually been learning Chayyeh Ulam and it's, it seems like he gets into great detail about his system. And there's a lot of usage of of these letters. Like he he broke it down into a system where you meditate on uh, the the seventy two godly names, mm -hmm. and for, for every and, and they're broken into into the godly names are, are broken into three uh, letters each. So that's twenty six together, twenty six twenty six permutations of three letters, and for every letter you add in, um, for every letter let's say it's a hey yud vav, you add in the the letter aleph. Yeah, and. With the with the nikud with the with the vowel that comes uh, in the way that letter is supposed to be expressed, you know, so you got to move. You meditate on that on that word. You got to pronounce it actually with your mouth, right? Um, with with, your, with sounds, and you also he brings in the idea of moving your head in that direction as well. So I think I think um, that, did, he, did they use the word seeding in that? I think that he I thought he says that he seeds the name of Hashem with the aleph. Does that actually do you actually see that in the Hebrew in there? I've seen it in English. The word seeding. I'm not sure what seeding means, but in his book, I don't have it here. I should I should have brought it. Um, he, yeah, he he basically the method is to add in, yeah, the to add in the aleph, right, to every letter, um, it, it, in order to give it the sound basically. Because if you just have the hey standing alone, oh, well, is it to get it the sound? I don't remember. But it's basically let's say like you have the let three, the first category of three letters. Let's say it's let's say it's hey yud vav, so you'll do. First combination is Aleph and Hey. And you will want to use all the different types of vowels. There's six different types of vowels that you right. want to all use right. for every combination. So it's like, let's say you have um, Aleph with a Kamatz. I don't know how you say that in English. It's like, we'll, have to, we'll have to draw it on the screen. And we'll have to draw it on. You know, you go, you know, you visualize it and you say it and you move your head, ah, and you move it to the right and to the left. Yeah, right, like there you go. You have like a, I, don't want to, I don't want to draw the Hey and the Vav, but if I can draw a Hey and then a Dash and a Yud. Just so I don't put Hashem's name there, but I think he said, you know, add the aleph here and write it out. And I'm putting dashes so I don't write Hashem's right. name. Yeah, and just it, actually just two letters, like without the third one. Yeah, I, I think the aleph is just where he adds it in. I think you start here, right? Just so start with the hey and the yud, right? You start with one with just the hey, and then you go on to so hey it's aleph hey, then then aleph yud, then aleph hey. So it's like yeah, like, yeah, that. like that. Very like good. That, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Very good. Very good. So I think he, his whole thing is that um, when you're doing this and you, you start practicing a method, then all of a sudden just, you know, letters come out and you start just selecting things, you know, and yeah, studies, dollars, gimels come out and yeah, it, I don't really she, understand it, but it really is that it's that composing, it's that instant composition like improv music. It just starts popping out after you do the expressed exercises that he gave. Right. Very right exactly. And it's, um, yeah. It's it's an interesting you know meditation that that was kind of like his uh, as he described his kind of uh, practice for prophecy really that's what he uh, claimed to also achieve himself uh, you know he even gives some some guidelines on how to respond when you hear a voice. Well, and, uh, well that's, I I was telling you about this book and I thought I'd right. read that now that you mentioned his achievement of prophecy. Okay, yeah. So this is Moshe Dell's new book, 
Um, actually, I got it from Germany, and I, hmm. I thought I thought I just put in for like a reservation. When I saw it online, but they actually it turned out to be an order, and they sent it to me without paying for it. So thank you to DeGreitner for trusting me. I, I, I amazing. Ended up, I ended up paying for it, um, but I didn't. I got it in the book in the mail. It's such a surprise. So they, I'm glad. I appreciate their trust. But um, this was the most amazing thing. Page two eighteen. If if I could just read a, a, a passage. Sure. Yeah. I've read a lot of Moshe Dell's books on Abulafi. They're amazing. This one is a whole nother level up. And he talks mm. about Abulafi's commitment to universals when he uses the word klali. A lot of times people say it means general, but mm. Edel says when Abulafi is using it, he means universal. And he says, these occurrences of the term related to universals in a relatively short text are too dense to be overlooked or underestimated. In my opinion, these terms, which convey a sense of being universal or general, constitute a major contribution to the meaning of the passage, and they should be interrogated in order that we may understand Abulafi's intent. More than any other Kabbalist with whom I am acquainted, Abulafi is especially fond of the language of universality. And this theme occurs not only in Or HaSechel, but also in many instances of his writings. For example, he refers to universal Kabbalah, to the universal prophecy, together with the knowledge of the Torah and the commandments in their general or universal way. Mm. And wow. he refers to the active intelligence as Haruach HaKlali, the universal spirit. Oh, interesting. Gold. Amazing. Gold. <laughs> oh, gold. I love it. I Amazing. love it. As you were saying, I was just thinking the word klali is broken into kol and li. So in other words, every, like all as, 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 you know, as, as global yeah. and li and me and I, a combination between global and the individual. Like that, like that, that combines that. The, the word klali. I like that. Actually, when so, you said that, I was thinking about a drusha. It could be koli, like also listening to my voice. Hashem's voice is also universal. Right, but well, koli is with a kuf. That's, I mean, drusha, right. I'm, I'm adding that the would kuf be, to the Right, ha. right. So like with the chaf, if kol and li, actually, that's, that's interesting. Like, yeah, very um, good. Very and, good. And that fits abulafia as well, very well, right? Klali yeah. is, in other words, the individualism and, and the globalism. I love that. That's a very, very good point. That, um, if I get back in touch with Moshe Idel, I'm gonna I'm gonna send him your chiddush. I'm gonna quote you. For sure, for sure. <laughs> it's only I'll only charge you a few dollars on it. Don't worry. You know my <laughs> address. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so that's amazing. I mean, so I mean, with with that with that being said, like I think I think one of like the dangers of the the let's put it this way: the danger with with you know being too nat national. And, and klali in a sense is where you, you, you could very easily lose the individuality, right? And in contrast, the danger of uh, being too focused on individuality, you could also lose the connection to the, to the general, to the klali, the global or the national. The bigger picture, yeah. And well, first of all, the word klali really, uh, really kind of shows how they need to work together and how they actually complete each other into one word. Um, wow. But, but I, think, I think there's a, I think there's a beauty, and I think Abu Lafia himself tried tried to achieve it, um, especially with with his his really strong will. And he I think he described it in one of his books of trying to to come to Israel, is where the individu individuality should lead um, to the to the national to the global. Yes. In other words, from the from the individuality, not to stay there, like as opposed to other religious practices where it really is just to disconnect from society and kind of stay in the individuality and and kind of just be you and, and be with you know within your entire life mm -hmm. there seemed to be a, a a system where the individuality should leave to the to the national to the global and um i've seen where he um awesome. he, he 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 more than other kabbalists that i that i'm aware of i'm not i'm not a professional like edel but abu afi really sees matan torah as a national event but also an individual event mm -hmm. you know he says you can there's a Matan Torah that you receive that goes in uh, everything in the Torah that happens, he can see it happen on individual level. Have you gotten to Matan Torah? You know, have you entered Israel, the level of an intellectual activity called Eretz Yisrael? You know, I'm sure yeah. he believed in Eretz Yisrael, the physical, but he also wanted us to, like you're saying, work on ourselves individually. You know, just living in Israel is not enough. You got to have Israel live in you in a sense, you know? Exactly, exactly. So, Get that high so, prophecy. So I love what you're saying about Klali, the call, the call, the the the, cool. the all and the Lee, getting that balance right. You know, I was talking yeah. with my friends this morning about how uh, Avram Avinu took the uh, knife and headed up to Yitzhak, and um, you know, sometimes we are really our identity is really really involved with the community, especially the Jewish community. You can be so involved, you can almost lose your individuality in it. And sometimes you've got to yeah. like 
I don't say, I wouldn't say use a knife, but in a dramatic way, you've got to make sure you have your own identity and then relate to others. You can't always just be Davuk, like just glued together. You got to have, right. you got to make sure you, you as an individual are advancing to help. It's a, it's, a, it's a tough thing. A, a lot of great scholars have been trying to figure out that balance and how, how do you do that? Like yeah. one of the most recent recent ones was Rav Shagar in Israel who passed, passed away a few years ago, like 10 years ago, but he really struggled with this with this idea. He, he was a very big, you know, uh, religious Zionist, right? The, and they're very strong. The religious Zionists are very strong in, in the Klali. They're very strong in the, on the national level. And, you know, mm -hmm. they give and they do and the army and everything. And they build the land of Israel, you know, but he, he felt there's a there's a, a bit of a loss of individuality and he he tried to create that balance with his philosophy and i think he did an amazing job but he struggled with it like it's, it's a very it's not a difficult thing to it's not an easy thing to do um yeah. but going back to like avraham avinu like one of our forefathers like that's a good example because like he was he was the first individual to go on an individual Jew, jewish journey in a sense i mean he wasn't officially a jew jewish just yet uh judaism i think only came about with yaakov um, but he was the first individual to kind of like find, you know, the, the, the monotheistic God, but his individual journey also led him to, um, to the land of Israel. So it's like, what's the connection there? Like, what does it have to do with it? And like you said, at first, the journey is not to a specific location. The journey is at first, you know, mm -hmm. is leave the place that you're at now on a conscious level, leave it in order to find something, a, a newer concept, a newer idea, a newer you, on a conscious level. At the end, he ends up finding it also on a physical level, like in the land of Israel. But the first it comes on, like you said, on like a conscious level. Like, so you could be living in Israel and not being in the consciousness of Israel. Yeah. You yeah. could be living yeah. outside of Israel and being in the consciousness of Israel. And you see many examples. Rabbi Nachman was like that. Abu Lafia was like that. They all lived in the consciousness of Israel. Then you also see individuals who, who managed to complete the picture, like, like the Arizal and Rabbi Moshe Kolevel, who kind of also lived in the land of Israel and in the consciousness yeah. of Israel. And you see like, I mean, every single one of them have unique philosophies, but... Um, well, that, that's, yeah. that goes back to that whole thing about transmitting the Masora, the same thing with Avraham and Yitzhak. You know, Avraham was such an individual, but if Yitzhak learned about being an individual from Avraham, that just defeats the whole purpose. You can't be Yitzhak learning it from Avraham. And so I, right. I actually see that as the knife in the air. It's like, you've got to be yourself. You've got to cut the connection to one of the greatest humans ever, Avraham, and you have to be yourself. That's very hard. It's hard to to be a Jew and learn the Masorah and still, after you learn all this information from other people, still find your own path. Right. Without exactly. breaking tradition. So I think Rav Shigar really struggled with it. I think Rav Cook, I really feel like he struggled with it. Yeah. Um, and, um, but I, I think that, you know, you and I've talked about that Abulafia for me sets out a path that is a Masorah, but also a path to your individuality, you know, by giving you all the letters and letting you combine them the way you want to combine them. There's the Masorah of the Hebrew language, but you create your own path with it. And I, that's unique. I haven't seen someone offer that. I think, it's, I think it's definitely unique. I mean, I think if we also kind of analyze just his kind of like persona or like, you know, the person that he was, he, he definitely like being so unique at that time and yeah. his studying being so not mainstream, so completely breaking the ordinary, right? In a beautiful way, right? In my opinion. Um, and that was his own individual journey. Like, that's what it was, this ecstatic, intense, uh, deep spirituality, yeah. um, Kabbalistic spirituality, or as he called it, prophetic spirituality. Mm -hmm. um, also, I think led him to be in, to be in a lot of pain. Like, in, like he, I think he was writing also out of a lot of pain because his individuality wasn't fitting with the regular mainstream. Absolutely. And, and I think he had pain there. I mean, he was moving from place to place. And uh, it, it was, it was, you know, it was, it was pretty... Um, common at the time to travel a lot but I, I do feel like through his words like there's a lot of like pain of this is this is who I am as Avraham Abu Lafia. this is my teachings this is my way um I think, he, like, I think he was I think he was also struggling with that that's what I'm trying to say is like he was also trying to find like how do I fit in this unique spiritual journey that he had I, I don't think he succeeded in his lifetime but but half, after he died he, he succeeded in other I words think that's, I think that's his teachings said. became yeah he um he he was um I think the Rashba was against Rashba. His, yeah and um yeah. you know and he wandered a lot and he had students that he would teach and they would go off and try to use it for magic and I think he was very frustrated right. and very very ahead of his time I mean he saw the universalism of Maimonides and he combined it with Kabbalah I mean things that 
it's just amazing. That was 800 years ago. And um, he didn't follow the Zohar path and the, um, I guess what they call it, the Theosophic Kabbalah, I believe is the, <laughs> he stuck to his, he stuck to his vision of what he thought was the path of Kabbalah and then, and for yeah. better or for worse. And he wrote his books and 800 years later, people are really starting to read him. 800, can you imagine that? People really appreciate what you're doing on planet Earth 800 years from now. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's insane. That's yeah. That's vision. Yeah. That's holding to a vision. For sure. That's unbelievable. I mean, with that said, I don't think we'll have time to go to our next chapter. So right. we'll just uh, keep speaking about Abu Lafia. But <laughs> he, you know, I, I, I just saw recently, you know, he was born in the year 5000, the Jew, Jewish count, 5000. That's amazing. And that, that's like the beginning of a millennia, right? And, um, and so the Gaon of Vilna, the Vilna Gaon, who was, who was also, funny enough, was a great Kabbalist. Um, even though he's known to be like, you know, the, the misnaged, the rationalist misnaged, but he, he had a, an um, he has an unbelievable interpretation of Sefer Yetzirah, mm -hmm. but he wrote a lot of Kabbalah and he wrote, um, I think based on Azal, based on other things where he kind of, he kind of like gives interpretation or kind of like a, a, a pattern towards like the, the final redemption. Yeah. And he breaks it down. He basically say like, it's, it's known in many places that this year 6,000 is like the final redemption, like the last millennia, the, the last 6,000 is that's that's the the main process of redemption and he broke it down into four quarters Which are very similar to the breaking to the four quarters of the day the 24-hour mm. cycle we have mm. we have uh, and You have midday And you have shkia and you have and basically four quarters which is 250 uh, Basically 5,000 5,250 5,500 5,750 and I, so at, at all those points, basically, I, I did some research to kind of like see what happens at those, like, those exact transition between quarters, like what happened at 5,250, like 5,500, which is Chatzotayom, is like where Kabbalah kind of like came out, like the Ariza, and Rabbi Moshe called the Vero, that was like the 15th century. 5,750 is Chassidut came out, Chassidut, and um, transitioned back to the land of Israel, kind of like the final point. But I, I never thought, like, what happened at the beginning? And then I kind of came across, like, Abu Lafia. Wow. Was born. And I'm yeah. like, you know what? Yeah. This makes a lot of sense to me. Because he was a foundation to everything that almost came up. You're saying 800 years? Yes, yeah, so 800 years, now people are really, like, accepting him and, and learning his studies. Right. But I think yeah. he was a foundation way before that. Like, slowly, slowly, he, he's mentioned in, in Rabbi Moshe called the Vero, that Ari mentions him. Very, yeah. very little, very briefly. But I think a lot of their philosophy are, are his foundation. I mean, we know his student, Rabbi uh, Joseph Chikatilia, yeah. who wrote um, one of the foundational Kabbalist, Kabbalist uh, books, uh, Shari Ola and Shari Tzedek, which are foundations to the rest of the Kabbalah. So I think you're right. 5,000, he's definitely a foundation. Like, there's, no, there's no chance there. Like, there's I no... Think, um, I think you see him. I, I've seen him written in Rabbi Chaim Vital, Rabbi Moshe Cordovero. Yeah. He stayed... He stayed within some of the framework very quietly and right. sitting there for 800 years, but he really was part of the spark that sparked it all off. And um, I think that the idea that uh, Git Katilia was part of the Zohar circle with Moshe de Leon, and uh, I really can see him as a foundation and started that school and uh, launched the Zohar. So, I mean, it is, it is fascinating to have scholars really giving us access to Abu Lafi in a way that I, I mean, I wouldn't understand the way Moshe Edel understands him, but it, it is the time and day in our age that we need a universal and particularist Judaism, you know, and it's the thing that modern Judaism struggles with. Sometimes people go so traditional, sometimes people go so modern and secular, and we can't get that at least tension between particular and universal <laughs> where we try to do both, study the halakha, follow the kashru, Torah, Shabbat, also, yeah be part of the universal human family. And I think Abu Lafia has blazed a trail for that 800 years ago before the modern era. That's no, wild, yeah. It's wild. Wild. So, it was ahead of, so ahead of the game. It's, a, I mean, I mean if, you want, if you want confirmation of an individual's prophecy, think about the vision he had 800 years ago of what a society would look like. That to me is prophecy that he had. The funny thing is he didn't, like he, he really came a lot of, he came with it on his own. Like, yeah. it's not like there were, I mean, you know, he was obviously a great scholar, Jewish scholar, and, and I'm sure he, he based everything on, on Torah and Judaism, but right. he was a pioneer in the sense, like he was a, he was a... I think he was a great, great synthesizer, because you can see that he studied the Rambam and said, I, I right. love 
was part of the study, Rabbi Eliezer Rokeach of Worms and the Ashkenaze, Chas, Hasid Ashkenaz, and took that. And then he just synthesized this new, amazing system that flourished and was so out of his day and age that he couldn't even really teach people directly. They couldn't catch on. I mean, he must have been frustrated. I think you make a good point there. So for us, I mean, I think that it's amazing. I think it's all this talk now is going to lead us to chapter 2-4 because we had to prep ourselves and yeah. our viewers for 2-4. 2-4 exactly. and safety exactly. is going to be a, it's going to be a trip. So we That's need to be a big one. Big one. Yeah. Yeah, Great for sure. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you everyone for watching and we're Thank back hopefully viewers. every and week. I do get a lot of private messages asking questions and follow up. So if anybody wants to keep private messaging or send it on the uh, Facebook chat itself, please feel free and hope everyone has a wonderful day. And Shavua Tov Ephraim. Shavua Tov. Shavua Tov to everyone.